Hi, my name is Laura Koholan, and you're watching See You at USC. Tonight, we're here with Mike Gunman, and we are going to be talking about the 54th anniversary of Sputnik and other astronautical gems, so stay with us. Hi, Laura Koholan, and we're here with Mike Gunman on CU at USC, and we are about to celebrate the 54th anniversary of Sputnik and learn all about astronautics at USC. So, Mike, you're the founder of the astronautics program here at USC. That's uh, a little bit exaggeration. We're always, <laughs> we're always we're doing something in space, but uh, I succeeded uh, to start uh, focusing our courses. And finally, in uh, I think it was seven years ago, the university made the decision to create a completely independent department in space engineering, which is called astronautical engineering. So we are one of the unique uh, programs, unique schools in the country. We're an independent department, pure rocket science. <laughs> That must have been a real triumph then to have, it sounds like you sort of built it up slowly and streamlined the, streamlined the courses so that you could cultivate it, is that how it worked? Uh, that's uh, that's uh, correct. Today we have a comprehensive program. We have undergrads, Bachelor of Science program, PhD and uh, Masters. But when we started, we focused on the Masters component, on the Masters uh -huh. program. And uh, this is the program that uh, the local industry and in Los Angeles is in the heart of the American space industry. So uh, a lot of companies around uh, USC within 100 miles, they build satellites, rockets, and then participate in space, also government agencies. And uh, the companies hire Bachelor of Science engineers, and then they send them, among other schools, to USC to get master's degree. And our program was exactly that we started to build what they wanted. And the enrollment uh, went through the roof, skyrocketed. We're rocket scientists, so we go to the <laughs> sky. We're going to the sky, and uh, uh, and I think the university. We can incorporate a lot of good space puns tonight if yeah. we try. <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, the university, the school, and the university liked uh, what we were doing, and there was a tremendous feedback from the industry and from the government. And uh, the uh, leadership, our dean of engineering at that time, who is today our president, at, at which Max, time? How long ago was it? It was in 2004. Uh, the dean Engin of engineering, Max Nikias, who today is the president of USC, right. he made the decision to create an independent department. And uh, from uh, that moment, I served as a uh, founding chairman. It's not easy, I can tell you. You guys as a students, you uh, enjoy a lot of things, but you don't see what, uh, how much hard work goes really? uh, uh, behind that. And so it was not easy, but we built it. We have a comprehensive program, one of the biggest in the country now. So yeah, I'm, I'm very interested. It's, it is a really unique program that does a lot of hands-on work that other schools aren't doing. What is it like to be in charge of something like that? You know, to be it's so, it's so involved in the field. Um, it's uh, part of the job. I we, we we have to do a lot of things. Uh, and by the way, uh, I uh, served as a chairman. Then uh, uh, another colleague, my uh, my um, colleague, another professor, became the chairman. So we rotate these uh, positions, mm -hmm. and uh, we all do science. We do engineering. Uh, USC is a research university. S a faculty is. Uh, uh, very involved. Meaning you, faculty. Uh, faculty you. Uh, yeah. Not me personally, but all uh, all, all, all professors yeah. in engineering or in science, they involved in many programs, uh, usually government funded programs, very competitive. So we have to compete. We have to bring funds for our students and for us to do science, publish papers, mm -hmm. publish books. So and education is part of that. So we are all excited that we can do that, and a lot of uh, very nice uh, students, uh, very excited, bright students benefit from that. So this uh, is what the universities do. And and specifically, what is it in the field that you guys are doing? Uh, it's usually uh, different professors are engaged in different areas. They're from the same big area, yeah. uh, say astronautics, but we all work in uh, different sub areas. Uh, one of my colleagues concentrates on the propulsion of space vehicles, yeah. another colleague concentrates on space plasma environment type. Uh, I, uh, at least last uh, 15 or 20 years, was uh, looking and working on the uh, study of certain phenomena in the solar system. 
as a matter of fact, certain uh, phenomena. Just a second, just a second. As a matter of fact, for the first time uh, during the last three years, mm -hmm. we finally mapped the galactic boundary of the solar system. It wow. I, it is a boundary about 100 mm -hmm. times farther away from the sun than the earth. And this is where the solar matter collides with the surrounding interstellar matter. We created a new eyes to look at that, and we uh, uh, remotely mapped it, put on the map the boundary of the solar system. When we go to other stars, like in Star Trek in the future, we will pass, zoom through that area. Oh my gosh. But we put it on the map, and uh, okay. uh, we even got on the cover of the science magazine with these discoveries. Hey, congratulations. <laughs> So, so oh. you, yeah, <laughs> whew, fight on. Um, you mapped the boundary of the solar system. What does that even mean? Like, there's no brick wall out there where suddenly you're like on the outside. Like, how does one define where it ends? Uh, that's true. There's no brick wall, uh, but the sun is the source of the so-called solar wind. It's a very oh. tenuous and but a very high speed flow goes in all directions, uh -huh. and that at the distance 100 times away from the sun, uh -huh. one times uh, farther than our Earth, it collides with the very tenuous interstellar gas. And so there, and that? It's just very diluted gas like we have here in the room. In uh, only it's uh, 20 orders of magnitude uh, less dense. That means you, uh, uh, in one cubic centimeter here in the room, we mm -hmm. have 10 to the 19 molecules. One and then 19 zeros molecules in one cubic centimeter. In the space around our sun, in the interstellar space, only one. So, Tiny so, you, so the de okay, so it's making my brain hurt a little bit, but the debt basically the it's edge of the science, solar system. Yeah, I was gonna say, it really is rocket science. <laughs> the, the edge of the solar system is based on the density of the different, correct? And, and this is the region where uh, the solar matter collides with the galactic interstellar matter. It sounds very good, but nobody could do it, and uh, as a matter of and you guys of, triumphed. And yes, we did. It's a it's a collaborative effort. It's many different institutions from uh, from the government, industry, other from other states uh, yeah. involved. The UEC played a very important roles in that. So we we are very excited. We did this discovery, and we know so what is happening there. But yeah. but we found more questions. We resolved some. Uh, outstanding questions. We got answers, but we now have even more questions that we had before. And this is how science. I was going to say, as is always the case with science. Correct. So, when was when did this happen? Oh, it's uh, l last several years. Uh, last several uh, years. Because the, the mission was launched in two thousand eight. Okay. It's a special dedicated mission with the instruments with the very sensitive eyes. Uh, still looking at there. So it's it's literally like mini satellites that you that your program sent up into space Correct. that did the work that Correct. allowed you to understand this. Uh, we participated at USC again it's a, mm -hmm. a number of institutions involved right. as everything right. because space right. is very expensive it's hundreds right. of millions of dollars and so we are just a small part of this team effort um, to do that. And when this triumph happened was it suddenly the kind of thing where more funding was pouring in or publicity? Did the science world know and did that bring notoriety to your guys' program? Uh, it, it got some attention as all these new results. Again, we ended up on the cover of one of the most prestigious mm -hmm. magazines, Science. And, uh, uh, but it's more questions now than answers. It's, it's typically how science is being done and the scientists may get you know excited for a day about publicity and then they go back to their computers it's um it's an uh, it's not that glamorous mm -hmm. li like many other areas because people really have to concentrate and get um, detached from the everyday uh, things that are happening around and just concentrate on this galactic boundary you know it's not exactly a concern of everyday life but well, I was but, but this about is it very this important morning. it was on my to-do list consider <laughs> galactic boundary issues w what are the next questions that this led to it said that there were so many that it led to so oh, we saw certain things that uh, that uh, uh, theories of concepts that we had did not predict we saw something new and we still do not have good explanations mm -hmm. and this is what makes science uh, very exciting because again when you see something you can't explain you, you try to work and find 
what is really happening there. So we need the next mission. We need another three hundred million dollars or something, and we will do that. That's convenient. <laughs> That's how much we pay our guests. So uh, you, it's a good thing you came on the show today. Yeah, the things are very expensive in space, and uh, and uh, again, the selection what what um, is being funded to do there. It's a very careful process of selection. It's not that somebody decided to do. It's a highly competitive area, extremely competitive mm -hmm. area. It's usually uh, after ten attempts to get something big, you get it. So you just keep going and at a certain moment. Uh, so is it hard, you know, you're working just casually on the, the boundary of the space solar system and, and you're not getting somewhere, say. And, it, you know, it's, it, A, it could be discouraging because it's your life's work and it's your passion. But B, do you have investors that are saying, we put X, Y, and Z money into this, you know, where are the results? Is that part of your job too? Not exactly that no. investors would be interested in the galactic boundary today. But we're doing some, uh, usually scientists work on a, uh, a few or several projects, mm -hmm. several areas that you are interested in. And uh, uh, one of those becomes big when you get this major funding, a breakthrough, but others maybe on the back burner and certain things are much more close to the applications that uh, we're involved in, uh, also in our department with students, uh, the building uh, small satellites mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and uh, uh, working with industry on other uh, uh, technologies, uh, we're in engineering school, so we're interested not only in science, but a lot of technologies. We're involved uh, in uh, pushing different space, new ideas, concepts, because it takes 20 years from a new yeah. idea to get to realization something in space. That's patience. And by the way, when I was um, maybe two or three years older than you are now, how, how long, old do you think I am? <laughs> long, long ago, uh, I, I actually thought about doing something like that, what we're doing now in space. Nobody believed that it could be done. There Wh was which like was what? The, the solar boundary thing? E correct. Okay. And there was probably like four or five people in the world who were interested in it. It took like 10 or 15 years to build the right technology. To even capa be able to capable, fathom capable to see uh, what we want to see. So it took 20, 25 years to get to this point, which is normal in space, in, in all big projects. It's, it's not unusual. Which but is it's why very rewarding. It's I was going to say, rewarding. which is why it would make your triumph even more gratifying. That's wonderful. Well, I wouldn't call, call it a triumph. It's, uh, um, it, it, it sounds a little bit too... Your too, benchmark. Too, your benchmark. Yes. All right. That's, that's Let's a call good that. place to pause. We'll have more Mark, Mike Grentman after the break. Now we're actually going to talk about it, the 54th anniversary of the launch of Sputnik. But first, we know that you want more CU at USC in your life. So to get in touch with us, you definitely have to go to at CU at the letters AT, so many at signs. And then that's our Twitter, at, at USC, and that's our Twitter. And you can read our tweets so that you know what's going on with our upcoming shows and retweet us. So, Mike, 54th anniversary today, and I was joking on with you earlier, and you said no one cares, but I care that it is the anniversary of the launch of Sputnik, and I want to know a little bit more because you have a really cool insider sort of perspective on that. Well, uh, that's true that I have a, a rather special perspective, and the reason is that I actually, when I first Sputnik, or Sputnik, if you pronounce it uh, oh, in a more correct way, really? but, but it's a standard way in the English language people pronounce Sputnik. So I when need we're to get we're a little more refined with my space lingo. Uh, when it was launched, I actually was uh, three years old and two and a half years old, mm -hmm. and I lived 20 miles from the place where it went right. up. I'm in what is now Kazakhstan. It was in Kazakhstan, and at least now it's very easy to explain where it is uh, because you can say, oh, this is where Borat comes for, yeah. from. And everybody says, oh, yeah, we know. <laughs> the, they want to see you wearing the green bikini. <laughs> they have a point uh, of reference. 
Yeah, so I am probably one of the one of the very few people in the United States, if any, who yeah. who grew up as a child in that place, uh, yeah. which is in the middle of the very harsh desert and uh, uh, where the launch site uh, was in Baikonur or Turatan, whatever is the, uh, the name you prefer to use. And again, uh, I'm probably maybe the only one in the United States and. Uh, and so, as um, you can tell from my accent, um, I am uh, hailing from east of Mississippi, at least. Uh, so it's long, long ago uh, I came to, to USC. Yeah. And, uh, but all my life, beginning from my childhood, uh, was linked to space, so to space exploration. And first in the Soviet Union and uh, then uh, in, the, in the United States, uh, where I, again, I came to USC directly to Los Angeles. I was washed ashore in California yeah. and in, with $80 in my pocket, uh, and I walked to USC. And after that, I'm, I'm working here in the space. Our That's a science, very dramatic space, space story. Space Only $80 industry. in your pocket, and then well, and now well, this is this. standard for immigrants. Many people just uh, went through that experience. It's not something uh, very unusual. But so, so. Uh, but we have to backtrack a little before we get to sure. the USC days. In Kazakhstan, Sputnik, is that how Sputnik. I say it? Sputnik. Sputnik. <laughs> it was launched. Were they picking, the, you know, the space race was going on and it was US, USA versus Soviet Union. Were they picking Kazakhstan because it was remote and it was sort of like a secret location where people couldn't really, the, the satellite couldn't really be like tapped? Uh, this is uh, exactly what you said. It's a combination of safety and security. Safety because you don't want, want things to fall on people's heads. Uh, and especially in the beginning of the space age, you don't want a, to lot, fall a lot of heads. stuff was falling down. And uh, that, uh, the, the seriousness of that statement yeah, just sort of sunk no, in. No, because, because the rockets, huge rockets yeah. exploded uh, before yeah. we really learned how to uh, build them right. Yeah. And even now, occasionally, there are major accidents. So, in uh, the early days, the safety was a major uh, concern. For example, in the United States, the analog of the launch site was built in Cape Canaveral and launches were going over Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. And Coast Guard clears, make sure there's no boats on the way, so this safety is very important. The second component is security. It was uh, built, uh, the Soviet launch site in Kazakhstan was built in a very remote area with a very harsh climate practically no local population because of the climate. Except you. And it was you were it representing it was, the like one local. It was, it was a military settlement that built it because uh, civilians couldn't even build it at that time. Uh, and uh, it was an engineering core uh, built it. And uh, uh, so this was uh, exactly safety and security. So it's very remote. Uh, nobody knew what it was. So in, what in was it like to live there? Give us a little picture. Well, it's a uh, tiny, tiny uh, place. It's uh, plus 100 degrees uh, in the summer. Minus so California is uh, chilly for you. Minus 40 or minus 50 in the winter. Mm -hmm. Horrible winds and it's uh, snow. And it was a very, very harsh climate. And again, because of that, there was no population, so it was uh, the right place to build a, a launch facility. So, it, and, and again, this was a, a small place, a lot of military personnel, there was uh, some civilian contractors, but I was a small child, I just remember very little. So uh, do you ever go back? now uh, to, to experience Kazakhstan. all that cold uh, well it's uh, not that easy uh, to, to, to go there uh, but right. um, one day I may be able just to go and visit it again but uh, right. it's not on the top of my priority yeah. there's, there's so many things are happening because as you know I'm doing uh, a lot of things in the university yeah. I have in addition to day job I do a lot of this historical writings on top that uh, um, as, as this stuff just uh, sits here and uh, shows so this is uh, so I'm a very busy guy I'm it's not number one on the bucket list that's right so you did you wrote the this is very conveniently placed in their Trojan colors you wrote the early history of spacecraft and rocketry let's pitch your books for all our viewers um, what what did writing I know that you wrote from a very technical perspective the history of spacecraft and rocketry but what did that teach you about the space race? Because the space race is sort of like this, um, you know, exciting and, you know, movies have been made about it and competitive um, political thing. Is it 
that way from your perspective as well? It was very political, it was very exciting, it mm -hmm. was very technical, it's exactly as you are saying. Except that, uh, except. except that many people have very um, uh, strange uh, views of certain events. They are also like a, the conspiracy uh, theories. Uh, well, not really conspiracy theory. Um, I would leave for people who enjoy them because they <laughs> say no, no, no reason even to waste time. So Neil that. Armstrong really did land on the moon. Um, <laughs> yes, and as a matter of not fact, as a ma as a matter of fact, we, uh, as you may know, uh, Armstrong was enrolled in the USC program oh. when this happened. He was stationed Let's see, at Armstrong at USC. He was stationed at the Edwards Air Force Base in Palmdale. Wow. When he was uh, and he we, he went from there the, to the moon and he was taking classes through distance education in our schools at, at USC at that time. Oh, Moreover, that adds we even more notoriety we, to our program. We brought uh, to our students several years ago uh, the partner of Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, okay. who landed with him on the on the moon. We brought in, it was a tremendous uh, event for our students, actually for USC community. Uh, uh, he gave a wonderful speech, and uh, the students interacted with him. It was a, a unique experience for many a students really cool to, to, meet, to, to meet to uh, meet the person who was you know, uh, one of the first of the moon. Right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so so, so uh, th there are a lot of urban legends. Uh, uh, people have some strange, uh, and the media propagates a lot of uh, these uh, stories. So, uh, and I wrote as a scientist, and uh, everything is correct. It is uh, verified. It's like a very precise scientific writing but you did write one other book which we also have here enemy amongst trojans a soviet spy at usc and i think the title tells it all i think it's a great catchy title but that is another story also about the sort of soviet espionage that was happening give us a little minute on the bio or the the synopsis of that book it sounds really exciting well, uh, it was uh, when I was working on my uh, space and rocket history, uh, I was looking, among other things, on the potential Soviet espionage in the United States. Mm -hmm. Like the Soviets, we know, stole a lot of secrets from the U.S. in atomic program, in atomic weapons program. So I was looking where there was something uh, similar in rocketry. And I began uh, to see a certain name of one Soviet spy that nobody knew what happened to him. And... Uh, do you know how interesting that is? Oh, and so and, of you. and and the, the story about him is that he was a graduate student at USC and part-time instructor in, in the political science department. And in 1945, he disappeared from a California beach. Oh and nobody knew what uh, happened to him. And then in 1950 or 51, the United States Congress published a big report on the subversive and espionage activities in the United States. And they said that this was a Soviet spy, and we still don't know who he was, how he escaped from the United States, what happened to him. And I, uh, as a scientist, as a good citizen at USC, it's, it's Trojan I'm a Trojan, here. I'm, Trojan a, I'm, I'm a Trojan. So I got interested. Nobody at USC knew anything about him, and I began uh, as a scientific project, uh, digging information, uh, going to archives, some declassified archives of the British counterintelligence in the United States. There were some Russian publications came out and I speak and read Russian obviously. So I uh, put the, all the story together. I even tracked uh, what he did when he escaped to the Soviet Union. Wow. And, and uh, I even found his, uh, on the internet, I found his son who was born when he was studying at USC. Oh so gosh. this baby, he's, he's so, sort of Trojan. And so you had to do some espionage yourself. Basically. <laughs> that's correct. And the Hollywood biopic is coming out soon because this is, that's really interesting and stuff. The, and the interesting is that uh, I think that the story about the spy at USC, it's a very a great uh, teaching experience because a lot of stories for students to uh, learn a lot of historical events that mm -hmm. were very important. And, um, and tied to your field. And, and, and on the top of that, what I thought our students probably should consider uh, this uh, Soviet spy who was uh, hiding at USC as a student, he was a stellar student. He, he got uh, straight A's uh, 
and uh, he was elected in uh, Phi Beta Kappa, for example, and Phi Kappa Phi. So, so maybe, are not maybe, as they seem. maybe our students who are members of these honor societies, maybe they should scratch his name from the <laughs> books. That's uh, what I would have done, but again, it's up to them. I'm That's a really intriguing end. We are all out of time. You as have always. To. As Sorry. always, yeah. There's never enough time to talk all about espionage and the entire history of space in one half hour. But thank you so much for joining us. Check out Enemy Amongst Trojans and check us out on Twitter and check us out tomorrow night and next week.